Okay, so next up we have Sharon Goldberg, who's going to tell us all about uh, non-custodial exchange, Arwen. Thanks very much for having me. I'm the co-founder, along with Ethan Heilman, of Arwen and the CEO. Um, it's a really a pleasure to be at a conference where everyone's so technical, so this is going to be fun. Um, so um, in this talk, I'm going to talk a little bit about what Arwen is, and then I'm going to spend like some chunk of time geeking out on how to build layer two protocols without SegWit. So if that is exciting for you, um, I will wake you up at that point. <laughs> Okay, so, um, so Arwen is a layer two protocol. What we want to do is we want to build a cross blockchain trading protocol that will accommodate as many coins as possible. Okay, so we don't wanna be restricted to a single blockchain. We don't wanna be Ethereum only or NEO only or Bitcoin only. In fact, we wanna accommodate as many coins as we possibly can and as many blockchains as we possibly can because people want to trade these things. Um, and we wanna do this fast at layer two. So trade should happen instantly. We don't wanna suffer the latency of um, on blockchain settlement, but we want to have this be secure, non-custodial, and using atomic swaps, okay? So let me show you how we do this. Okay, so first of all, why is this problem interesting? Um, centralized exchanges continue to be the place where most of cryptocurrency trading is happening. There is a massive amount of money flowing through these exchanges, and because there is a massive amount of money flowing through these exchanges, that means great liquidity, good prices, and attackers want to target them, steal the money. And so this is stuff that actually happens, and you can see a list of, um, of, of, of instances. And of course, if you've been following the space, you've probably heard about the Quadriga uh, fiasco, which continues to get more and more crazy every week. Um, and so there are a lot of issues with um, sort of the honeypot of coin that's sitting at centralized exchanges. And so we view this risk as entirely unnecessary. The reason we view that is because these exchanges are for trading cryptocurrency. Cryptocurrency is backed by blockchains. Blockchains are a root of trust that you can trust to secure your coins. So why aren't we using them to secure your coins? So that's our point of view on this ecosystem. Um, and so where Arwen sits is we think that centralized exchanges are great places to trade but um, why do we need to trust them with our coins? Okay, so let's not trust them. Um, what should we trust instead? So something that's, uh, you know, one thing we could trust instead is a trusted third party who's not the exchange. So if we use, like for instance, the model that's used in traditional financial services, you would not take your coins or your money or your assets and put them on the exchange at which you're trading. What you would do with those things is you would put them in a custodian who would hold those for you, and then you could trade on the exchange which is not holding your coins, right? So that's sort of the trusted third party model, and we're starting to see that emerge in the cryptocurrency space, for example, with BitGo. Um, so that is one model where we trust a third party. Um, there's some really interesting academic work um, on trusting um, uh, basically a trusted execution engine, like a, um, a hardware module that you can trust. Um, as long as it doesn't get hacked, you're, you're going to have secure trading. Um, we, had, we heard a lot about Binance DEX, right? So what is Binance DEX? Binance DEX is its own blockchain that enables cryptocurrency trading. So we've introduced a new blockchain that's allowing us to trade. So we're not going to have to trust the exchange. We're going to have to trust this new blockchain. Same ideas in the Waves platform. It's a DEX, but it has its own blockchain that's the trades are happening on that special purpose blockchain. Right? So our point of view is actually we don't want to have a new blockchain. We don't want to trust anyone. We want to actually use the blockchain that is the reason that these coins have value. So for instance, if the reason that Bitcoin have value is because there's the Bitcoin blockchain that exists to back these Bitcoins. The reason that Ethereum has value is there's the Ethereum blockchain that backs these coins. So we want to use the actual native coins that these, uh, the native blockchain that these coins are on and use that as our root of trust and not trust anyone else, okay? So not your keys, not your coins, self-custody your coins, keep them in your ledger, keep them in Coinbase custody, keep them in your, you know, Android wallet or your Samsung phone, which now has a crypto wallet in it. Um, and don't trust anyone other than the blockchain that is the blockchain that these coins are from. So that's our point of view on this space. Meanwhile, you want to be doing this while you're still enjoying um, the security, uh, the, the, the liquidity and speed of a centralized exchange. So the way that we do this um, is we do this in the model of atomic swaps. So for those of you who were here an hour or so ago, we talked a little bit about atomic swaps. Um, when I say atomic swaps, I mean specifically the security property of atomic swaps. So I think the word atomic swaps is sometimes used to assume we mean on blockchain atomic swaps. What I'm talking about here right now is just the crypto property that we want. And the property is the following. We have Alice, she has a Bitcoin. We have the exchange, it has a Litecoin. They want to swap these coins. So an atomic swap ensures 
that Alice's coin goes to the exchange, that the Bitcoin ends up at the exchange, and the Litecoin ends up at Alice. So either they swap or they don't swap. It cannot be the case that Alice gives up her Bitcoin, but the exchange did not give her back the Litecoin. Okay? That is all atomic swap means to me. But atomic swap is a very, very strong security concept because it must hold, even if one of the parties is adversarial, completely hacked, completely out to get the other party. So for instance, if the exchange is trying to steal Alice's coin, she cannot, it cannot do it. If Alice is trying to steal coins from the exchange, she should not be able to do that. And atomic swap guarantees that either the swap happens or doesn't in this very malicious adversarial situation. So atomic swaps were called fair exchange by cryptographers, actually. Um, in 1999, there was a paper that said that atomic swaps, basically at the time fair exchange, is impossible unless you have a trusted third party. Um, then there was a paper in, tw in 2012 that pointed out that you can do atomic swaps if you use the blockchain essentially as a root of trust. And this is a really, really cool result. And so, if, you know, personally, I think that this is one of the real reasons that blockchains have value. It breaks down barriers in cryptography, it eliminates you know, impossibility results that have been blocking progress for years. And this is what's really exciting about this. So we want to use this technology in one of the most active use cases of blockchain and cryptocurrency, which is trading. Okay, so that's where we stand. Um, in my previous slide, I just showed you an atomic swap between um, Alice, the trader, and the exchange. Um, if anyone has been playing with DEXs, uh, this probably looks really weird to you. Usually you see an atomic swap between Alice and Bob, right? So our point of view here is different. Um, our point of view is that the trades are going to happen from the wallet of Alice to the wallet of the exchange. This is actually very similar from how you do trading today on an exchange. When you trade today on an exchange, the first thing that you do is you take coins from your wallet and you deposit them in the wallet of the exchange. That allows you to trade on the exchange. Right? That allows you to access the liquidity of the exchange. So we are preserving this idea that the wallets involved are Alice's wallet and the exchange's wallet, but the trades themselves will actually go through the exchange's order book. Okay? So Alice will be trading with Bob, who's a user of the exchange, but the actual movement of coins is from Alice's wallet to the exchange's wallet. This is very similar to what you do today. You deposit your coins at the exchange, but you're actually taking orders with whoever it is on the order book that you've matched with at that exchange. So we're preserving that model. The result of this is that because the trades go through the order book at the exchange, Alice can be the only Arwen user at the exchange and she'll still get good prices. We don't fall into the, the issue that you sometimes see with DEX is if there's no one on the DEX, the liquidity is not good. There's no one to trade with if there's no one on the DEX. If there's only one person speaking Arwen at the exchange, they can trade with the rest of the order book. Okay, and we thought that that was very important because we worried about actually growing these protocols and bootstrapping these protocols. Um, the other, the other thing that, um, that, that is, we think is important here is that when Alice is doing um, an atomic swap with an exchange, if the, atomic, if the exchange actually is trying to um, you know, actively steal Alice's money, that would look really bad for the exchange. This is very embarrassing for the exchange. And so a lot of the issues that we see with atomic swaps that were actually pointed out by James in a couple talks ago, when you do an atomic swap with someone, all the atomic swap guarantees is that either the trade happens or that it doesn't happen. So you always have the risk of griefing that the other side will just decide not to trade with you because it's more fun for them to do that and now you just wasted your time and your money, right? When you're doing this at an exchange, an exchange has very little ish, uh, incentive to grief you because its entire reputation is at stake. Its goal is to have as many people trading there not to actually you know, mess around with an individual trader. So that's our point of view on that. Um, you compare that for the majority of atomic swap approaches. When people hear atomic swap, they automatically think it's from Alice's wallet to Bob's wallet, um, that there's going to be limited liquidity um, because you can only trade with users that are speaking this atomic swap protocol, um, that there's the risk that Bob will abort. Um, but this is, the, this is what people talk about when they say decentralized. And so when we describe R, when we don't use the word decentralized, we use non-custodial, we use atomic swap, we use secure, not decentralized. R1 is centralized. Okay, so how does this thing work? Um, with Arwen, we have to find some way to self-custody our coins while we trade on an exchange. So the idea is instead of depositing your coins in the wallet of the exchange, you're gonna deposit your coins in an escrow on the blockchain. So in this case, I'm setting up a Bitcoin escrow with the exchange coin boss. And um, the agent of escrow for this, uh, for this uh, escrow is the Bitcoin blockchain, okay? So this is an escrow on the Bitcoin blockchain with CoinBoss. 
The important things that you'll see, this is actually from the R1 app. If you want to go download it, you can go do this right now on testnet, um, on Bitcoin testnet. Um, the important things are the um, expiry time. So each escrow is set up for a particular time, and then it has an expiry. The other thing that's important is the wallet address. That is the address at which your coins will go when the escrows close. That's your uh, custodian for your coins. Um, so, so for instance, it would be like your ledger if you were doing um, self-custody that way. And then you would move your coins into this escrow the same way that you would move coins into any address on a blockchain. So that, uh, that hash, that, that Bitcoin address that you see there is actually the hash of the escrow smart contract. That's how smart contracts work on Bitcoin. So um, moving out of the app, what are the escrows in Arwin? So this is an Arwin user escrow. Um, user escrow is funded by the user. So those are Alice's five Bitcoins that she deposited in this escrow. The escrow is time locked to some specific time, which is an absolute time. So as you could see in a couple of um, screens ago, um, it's a, a date, a time and date that you pick. Um, and then um, this is a smart contract. So what is the condition on the smart contract? The condition is that the coins are locked in the smart contract unless we have a signature by both the user and the exchange. So this is a two of two multi-sig. So both the user and the exchange have to sign in order to move the coins. That's the first clause you can see here. That's user and exchange. And then the second clause that you can see here is that after the, ex the escrow expires, the user can take back her coins. Okay, that's the first, um, that's the first escrow. In Arwen, there are two kinds of escrows. There are escrows that are also funded by the exchange. So in this case, we have an escrow that's funded by the exchange for 500 Litecoins. Um, again, it has a time lock to some other time, time B. Um, you know, we had to do some protocol trickery to make these two times unrelated, so they can be any times, they have no relationship. And um, again, we have this two of two multi-sing, the user and the exchange have to sign in order for this escrow to be closed and for the coins to be released back into your wallet, or the escrow has to expire and then the exchange can take the coins back. Okay, so that's the first step in Arwin. We haven't done any atomic swaps. We haven't done any trading. These are just escrows that are collateralizing any trades that you're going to do. Your trades will be off blockchain. Okay, so this is on blockchain, um, and it replaces the step of depositing your coins in the exchange's wallet. The security of the Arwin protocol comes from the requirement that users attempt to close their escrows before they expire. Okay, so these time locks are what give us the security. As long as the user makes sure to close their escrows before they expire, even if the exchange is attacked, they will not lose their coins. So let me show you um, something that we did that we thought was really fun. We had to test our coin recovery process for Arwin. So how do you test something that operates against an adversary? We actually built an adversarial exchange, so I don't know how many of you saw this. Our adversarial exchange, if you go to testnet now, is called Mount Fox. If you trade at Mount Fox, there's a 50% probability that you will be attacked. So um, in this case, we were trading at Mount Fox. We tried to close an escrow, and Mount Fox refused. This is an attack. Basically, it's, it, it's sort of like the idea, like you deposited your coins at the exchange, and then the exchange went offline and wouldn't give you back your coins. Same kind of idea. Um, what Arwin would do is it would observe that Mount Fox refused to close the escrows, and it would tell you to come online at a particular time and recover your coins. Okay, so at the point where the attack happens, your Arwin app detects it, notifies you, tells you about the time to, to, to recover your coins. Okay, so that's essentially the way Arwin works. It's all based on time. Um, and you don't have to be online at all times. You just have to be online when you get one of these notifications that tell you that you have to be online. Okay, so that's the sort of like high level idea. Arwin is a layer two protocol. So we've heard this a lot today. What a layer two protocol means is it's a protocol where part of the action happens on the blockchain and part of it happens off blockchain. So there are computations that occur on off blockchain that are backed by what is on the blockchain. And this is good because we get a lot of nice things that I'll tell you about in a second. So we have these two escrows. Now we can swap Bitcoin for Litecoin. We can trade Bitcoin for Litecoin. Because this is a layer two protocol, we can do multiple trades against these escrows. So it's not just one trade, I can do as many as I want, um, as long as I don't exceed the values in escrow. Um, so I can do multiple trades, and then when I'm finished trading, I would close my escrows, and that would uh, release the coins, put them back into my wallet, and then I can use them for other things other than Arwin. Okay. So the reason that we want a layer two protocol is because layer two protocol give us speed. These trades happen instantly. If you try the Arwin app, trades will take, 
trades just involve messages going back from the user to the exchange. There is no on-blockchain execution, so it's fast. Um, we, we remove the front-running risk, and then we, I, th I think that personally that this is extremely important. The only parties that see what's going on between you and the exchange are you and the exchange. You're not broadcasting your transactions to the blockchain in the middle of a trade. Um, there is no third-party griefing um, because nobody sees what's going on between you and the exchange. They can't disrupt that. This is in contrast to other DEXs where execution happens on the blockchain. Um, and finally, we get the nice scalability part, which is that we can do lots of trades, but we don't have to hit the blockchain with every one of these trades. Okay. Um, so now to get into the really technical part here. So our point of view on how to build a system like this was to build something that supports as many blockchains as possible. And so what is the lowest common denominator blockchain in terms of smart contract uh, richness? Right, so that is not Ethereum. I mean, Ethereum is very, very rich. Um, Bitcoin is pretty poor in terms of smart contract uh, functionality, but what's even more poor than that is Bitcoin Cash, which is basically Bitcoin without SegWit. And we can support Bitcoin Cash with this protocol. So we built this protocol to work with the very minimal, um, minimally functional uh, s uh, smart contracting language, um, which, is, which is essentially Bitcoin-derived coins without SegWit. Okay. Um, let me just show you quickly how a trade works. I'm going to show you the smart contract behavior to, to have this trade work. Um, the first trading instrument that we built with Arwen is called a RFQ, a request for quote. The way an RFQ works is that you make a request for the amount of coin, let's say, that you want to sell. Um, and I'm going to show you the protocol. So when you make a request, the exchange will choose a random value x. Um, and hash that value to get a number y. So this is just one hash. There's no proof of work here at all. This is just a hash. You get y. We call y the puzzle. The exchange will generate a transaction that contains this puzzle. There are three outputs to this transaction. The first one says um, the user has a balance of zero, right? So we've done zero trades at this point, so the user still has a balance of zero. The exchange has a balance of, 500, um, of 400 Litecoins because there's 100 Litecoins that are going to go up for grabs as part of this trade. Okay? So that 100 Litecoins is basically locked under this puzzle. Um, when you um, send over the quote to the user, she can decide whether or not she wants to take it. If she wants to take it, she generates her own puzzle transaction, which has the same puzzle Y in it. Um, and then it, she puts one Bitcoin up for grabs under this puzzle, which you can see over here. She sends that over as part of her order. And at this point, um, the exchange has the ability to execute this trade because by revealing X, um, these outputs that are locked under that puzzle can be released and sent back to the, to the wallet. Okay, so that's the protocol. It's a very simple HTLC protocol, but we had to make this secure in a, in, a, in a blockchain that doesn't have um, SegWit. Okay, so that's basically what's happening here um, behind the scenes. Um, why is this an atomic swap? The reason that this is an atomic swap is that the exchange has a choice at this point in the system. Um, for the last step, the exchange can either reveal X or not reveal X. Sorry, this is in the way. So the exchange can either reveal X or not reveal X. If the exchange reveals X, then um, both of these puzzle outputs can be spent. If the exchange does not reveal X, then neither of them can be spent. And that gives us the atomic swap property, right? If X becomes public, then we can spend them both. Okay. Um, all right. So, so um, one interesting thing here is what happens if the exchange decides not to reveal X and just runs off in the middle of a trade? Right? And so in that particular case, that exchange would be violating the, beha the normal behavior of an RFQ. An RFQ is a trading instrument in which once you give a quote, you're expected to execute on a quote. If you don't like a trade, you don't give the quote. If you like the trade, you give the quote, you're expected to execute. Um, so if the exchange doesn't execute, it's misbehaving. And so Arwen will fix that. Right? And here's another example of trading with Mount Fox that aborted a trade with us. Um, and then Arwen is detecting that that happened freezing the escrows and telling you that you need to come online at a certain point in order to recover your coins. Okay, so these are kind of the two scenarios in which we end up with attacks um, in this protocol. And again, the Arwen app will detect that this happened and detect the time period at which you need to come back online and tell you that time period and then you can recover your coins. Okay, so that's the sort of like uh, overview of how it works. And then I'm gonna start um, with the protocol pieces.
Okay, so here we go. Um, so uh, coins that don't have SegWit have a problem called transaction malleability. And interestingly, this is actually one of the reasons that Mt. Gox was hacked in 2014. So what is transaction malleability? So let's look at, at, at what happens in Arwin. These are the three types of transactions. Uh, this is three out of, um, I guess, seven types of transactions we have in Arwin, but these are the most important ones. Um, so uh, the escrow we talked about before, the puzzle, and then um, this is this transaction that reveals the solution. Right. So um, in the case that we, um, we have something like this, there is a difficulty. Let me show you what the difficulty is. So transaction malleability comes from the way that transaction IDs work without SegWit. And the way that they work is that they take the transaction and they take any signatures on the transaction and they hash all of that together. Okay. So that sounds fine, right? Usually when we identify a transaction, we would like to have only one such transaction with that identifier, right? There should be a one-to-one -one mapping between transactions and transaction IDs. Problem is that um, the signature on a transaction in Bitcoin is a particular kind of um, elliptic curve signature, okay? It turns out that this cryptographic algorithm is a randomized algorithm. So that means that for a given message, you can have a large number of possible signatures that are valid. That's because it's randomized. Worse yet, if you take a message and its signature, and you don't know anything about the secret keys or anything else about the signature, you can just make the signature negative, and it will still be a valid signature. So that basically means for any given message and signature, you can produce another different message and signature um, that will still be valid. And so that means the signature is malleable. Okay? So how do we exploit this malleability? You take a message and signature, right? basically a Bitcoin transaction and its signature. You make the signature negative, And now the transaction ID is completely different. Does that make sense? Because hashes will give you a completely different output even if you change one bit. So you change one bit on the signature, you get a completely new transaction ID, even though the transaction is completely valid. Okay? So if you never understood what SegWit was, this is the reason this is what it fixes, one of the things it fixes. Um, and so uh, to exploit malleability, you can basically break pointers between transactions, okay? So by just flipping a bit on the signature. Now, for a long time, people didn't care. Why did they not care? Well, because you can't go around changing signatures of transactions that are confirmed on the blockchain. If something was confirmed on the blockchain five years ago, there's nothing I can do to change its signature, right? So transaction malleability is not interesting when you're thinking about things that are on the blockchain. You can't flip signatures on the blockchain. However, if things are off blockchain, you can flip their signatures. And this is where it starts to matter. And so when layer two becomes important, uh, transaction malleability becomes really important. Okay? So that's why most layer two protocols require fixes against transaction malleability. In particular, Lightning Network is one of the most well-known. So um, let's weaponize this now. So let me show you an attack. Um, I'm going to give you a puzzle transaction, right? So remember that my escrow, uh, in order to spend this escrow, I need a transaction signed both by the user and the exchange, okay? So let's say we just need a transaction signed by two parties, okay? So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to give you a puzzle transaction that I've signed, and then, um, you know, and then I'm going to say, like, here's the puzzle and here's the solve, right? So now you've actually been able to claim all the coins involved in this trade. Let's say I did that. Then you give me my Litecoins, because I'm giving you these Bitcoins in order to get some Litecoins. And um, you, um, you, you, try to, you try to actually claim these Bitcoins. Okay, so what happened was I gave you a puzzle transaction. I gave you a solves transaction. Um, you sent me my Litecoin. Then you sign these things and post them to the blockchain to try to claim your Bitcoin. Okay, so that seems like a fine thing to do. The problem is what's going to happen in my attack is that when my puzzle transaction hits the blockchain, someone is going to flip the bid on the signature. For example, a miner that I'm cooperating with will flip the bid on the signature and put it in the blockchain. So when that happens, the pointer between the solution and the puzzle goes away, right? So the fact that I've, right, because if I've changed, if I flipped a bid on the puzzle, uh, on the puzzle, then the signature is no longer valid, the transaction ID changes, and so the link between the solve and the puzzle completely goes away. And so the fact that I've given you a sign solve transaction is of no value to you. I've signed the wrong thing. I've signed something that's pointing at nothing. It's useless, right? And so at the end of the day, your solve transaction is useless, and I profit. I got your Litecoin, and I didn't give you any Bitcoin. 
Okay? And this is the challenge with layer two protocols. The risk is someone gives you a signed transaction and then mauls the parent, and that signed transaction is garbage. Okay, so Arwin, Arwin is robust to transaction malleability. Why? Because we never actually give you a signed solved transaction. If you remember what we did in Arwin, what we did was we revealed the puzzle. We did not give you any transactions at that last step. Okay? So that is really essentially the, the um, that is essentially what you're doing when you're designing protocols um, without SegWit. You're designing protocol with your hands tied behind your back. There's very few things you're allowed to do without, before you hit transaction malleability bugs. So let me tell you what you can do. You can have off blockchain um, depth of two. So here's my first off blockchain transaction. Here's my second one. That's it. I can't go any deeper than that. Okay, so I have to build my entire protocol with that. The second thing that I need is I cannot have any multi-sigs in my off-blockchain transactions. So this puzzle transaction cannot use any multi-sigs. If someone gives me a signed puzzle transaction, it's of no value to me because the solve can be manipulated. So I have to build my entire protocols using um, depth two off-blockchain and no multi-sigs off-blockchain. Okay, and that's what we've done with Arwin. So there's a whole set of protocols that we've designed for off-blockchain training that are written with these entire, uh, with these restrictions. And so in, in a sense, this is annoying because it makes all the complexity of the protocol go into the off-blockchain part, um, into the communication and not into the smart contract. But on the other hand, it's kind of awesome because we can support many blockchains. And so that's why we're able to go from um, Bitcoin Cash to Bitcoin to Ethereum and other protocols that have um, more uh, rich uh, smart contract environments. So, um, so to wrap up, um, our approach is not your keys, not your coins. Self-custody your coins while you trade at a centralized exchange. Um, don't trust anyone other than the blockchain of which the coins are originally from. Um, we use layer two uh, uh, cross-blockchain atomic swaps. Uh, we support many coins. Um, we have fast trades, um, scalable, avoid the front-running problems that you see in a DEX. So just to, to wrap up, what we've built so far is this ecosystem. So Arwin is a startup. Um, we're based here in Boston. Um, we uh, are not just a protocol, although this talk was about the protocol. This is the stuff that we've built. So we, um, we do not build wallets, uh, but we do, it, um, we do build the Arwin daemon, which speaks Arwin on behalf of the user. Um, that would sit, for example, on your machine, on your desktop. We have a GUI in front of that, the Arwin trade app. That speaks the Arwin protocol on behalf of the user to the exchange. And then um, we actually have a cloud that speaks Arwin on behalf of the exchange. So any exchange that works with us would be speaking Arwin through the cloud that we built. Um, so currently we have Bitcoin, Bitcoin Cash, and Litecoin support. We're building out additional uh, coins. Um, and the first exchange that we're launching with within the next few weeks is KuCoin. So everyone should go get a KuCoin account and do KYC on KuCoin so that you can trade with us. Um, and that's it. Um, if you'd like early access to our mainnet release on KuCoin, we actually have an internal release already that's working. Um, if you would like to be one of our first testers, please uh, go there and uh, let us know your name. Um, and finally, if you have any questions, please uh, hit up our CTO, who's a Twitter expert, and we'll answer all of them. Thank you. Thanks so much, Sharon. So uh, I think we have time for maybe one or two questions, uh, and then we're moving into the truly centralized custodial exchanges panels where I sort of yin and yang to this, this expert. You mentioned something earlier about Monk Ox. You said something about the transaction malleability. Can you yeah. explain a little bit more about that? Yeah, so the question was, what does transaction malleability have to do with Mt. Gox? So when Mt. Gox was attacked, they were using transaction IDs to identify transactions. And so someone was mauling the transactions. And so the transactions IDs they were watching for on the blockchain were actually not there. And so they were doing more withdrawals than they should have because they, they were looking for transaction IDs that weren't there. Wow. It was, it's really actually a horrific, it was a pretty clever attack, actually. Yeah. Um. Thanks for the, for the talk, it was great. Uh, do you have any plans future on in the roadmap for constructions with even more restrictive scripting environments? I'm thinking of like Grin and Beam and, and the like where there's like a fundamental restriction on what's even possible yeah. for the scripting language? We haven't done that work yet, no. We haven't looked at like even weaker than this. Yeah, sure, yeah. That's, that's fair. That's yeah. Fair. yeah. Um, can you talk about your time lock assumptions? Yep. Okay. Um, I'm assuming like there, there's some late latency here because of your time lock assumption, or am I wrong there? Yeah, okay, so our time locks are, are 
I'll just talk until they set up the table, and then I'll go away. Um, so our time locks are, um, are set up so that the user, like a human being, has enough time to come online and actually do what they're expected to do. So the protocol creates these different periods at which you can do different kinds of coin recovery, and we like put something like 24-hour uh, window there so that you know, the chances are the blockchain won't completely you know, be terrible and for 24 hours, and you would actually be able to get your transactions on the chain. Okay, yeah. all right. Thank you.